Second scripture reading, it comes from the Gospel of Luke. If you want to follow along in your pew Bibles, it is on page 66. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, he took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner... Having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. And then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man was a prophet... He would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose, the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. And then he turned toward the woman, and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has stopped, not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began saying to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he went through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who'd been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Shusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. The Gospel of the Lord. Paul and Galatians preached radical grace. He did it as well when he shared the gospel with people. It was so radical, Paul maintained it could be applied to any culture. And although it flowed from the wellspring of Judaism, it did not need the laws and the customs of that faith to flourish. Paul saw this radical message contained in the law and the prophets But he saw something very distinct, a kernel, a center, a kerygma of teaching that pointed to a radical grace that went beyond the bounds of Judaism and was for everyone. And when Paul said it was for everyone, he meant that. He meant everyone. Please don't read Paul as a supersessionist. That's the belief that Christianity is some sort of complete replacement for Judaism. Paul does not discard his own Jewish roots. He continued the faith practices that had served him well since his youth. Paul is more of what we might call an expansionist. He took the core message of a gracious and loving God who always sought the salvation of the wayward of Israel, and he expanded it to say that God sent Jesus not just to bring a new kingdom to the Jews, but to bring this new and amazing kingdom of heaven to everyone and everywhere. When Paul said everywhere, he meant everywhere. God's grace is radical because it is for everyone and it goes everywhere. Paul preached that amazing message to the Galatians. Their reconciliation with God was made possible by Jesus Christ, his life, and his death on the cross. It 
was finished, complete. The love of God flowed into the world and the Galatians were already awash in that. Paul helped them recognize the grace that surrounded them. It was not their own doing. They didn't need to do anything else to add to it. That's the stunning wow factor message and it's true for us as well. There's nothing more for us to do. Radical grace. Radical grace indeed. Understanding the radical nature of this grace and why it deserves phrases like wow and amazing and incredible requires us to move deep into our beings. When we read the phrase faith in Christ, we make the mistake of thinking just about mental assent far too often. We'll stand at the end of the sermon, and together we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe can become a phrase isolated to the cerebral regions of our beings when it should be a commitment of all that we are. We are children of the Enlightenment and the scientific age, and often that is a good thing. But for faith, Enlightenment and the scientific age don't tell the whole story. Paul Tillich touches on this in The Shaking of the Foundations and describes how cerebral faith can even impede our experience of grace. He asks the question, do we know what it means to be struck by grace? It doesn't mean that we suddenly believe that God exists or that Jesus is the Savior or that the Bible contains the truth. To believe that something is, is almost contrary to the meaning of grace. Furthermore, grace does not mean simply we're making progress in our moral self-control and our fight against special faults and our relationships to men and society. Moral progress may be a fruit of grace, but it is not the grace itself. And it can even prevent us from receiving grace. For there is too often a graceless acceptance of Christian doctrine and a graceless battle against the structures of evil in our personality. Such a graceless relation to God may lead us by necessity either to arrogance or to despair. It would be better to refuse God and the Christ and the Bible than to accept them without grace, for if we accept without grace, we do so in a state of separation and can only succeed in deepening our separation. We cannot transform our lives until we allow them to be transformed by the stroke of grace. It happens or it does not, and certainly it does not happen if we try to force it upon ourselves, just as it shall not happen so long as we think in our self-complacency that we have no need of it. The radical nature of grace touches all that we are. Our redemption, Paul says, involves our death and not just the death of our sin and guilt. We tend to focus on sins as being what Jesus took care of on the cross, and there is that mysterious effect associated with that. But it isn't just our sins, Paul says. He says we die with Christ. All that we are is nailed to the tree with Christ. Everything that I am is plunged into the waters of baptism and consumed in the life of Christ. For only by David Richmond Smith being consumed completely in the death of Christ can David Richmond Smith become a new creation where I'm raised from the waters of baptism. We really don't want to consider that. Too often we don't want to consider what it means to dying all to our, of everything we are. We want to hold parts of our lives safe, away from that dying with Jesus. Jesus challenged us to take up our crosses daily. And we've all jokingly or even seriously referred to some earthly burden or challenge as a cross we must bear. But that's not what Jesus is saying. The cross we take up each day is our willingness to die in Christ so that we may live again in him. Grace is for everyone, and grace goes everywhere, and it's not based on what we do, and it comes from outside of us, and in grace we die in Christ, and in grace we're raised anew with Christ. Radical, radical grace. 
Jesus was invited to this dinner party, as you heard from the gospel lesson. And the host didn't even bother to provide basic hospitality for Jesus. It was probably his way of paying Jesus sort of a backhanded compliment. A woman showed up, and she found herself in the presence of grace incarnate. She understood this and felt it, even without Jesus having to speak to her. She wept, and she washed his feet in gratitude with her tears. And the Pharisee was so blinded by his pride, he couldn't see the grace that Jesus offered. By worldly standards, his his sins might have seemed small that day. (laughs) But the biggest sinner in the room, that was the Pharisee. If only he'd seen what the woman saw, he too would have been weeping at Jesus' feet. He too would have been able to hear the message of peace and forgiveness that Jesus offered. The woman found grace that day because she came face to face with her own pain and her own brokenness and was struck by God's grace in that moment. Tillich again. Grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. It strikes us when we walk through the dark valley of a meaningless and empty empty life. It strikes us when we feel that our separation is deeper than usual because we violated another life, a life which we loved or from which we are estranged. It strikes us when our disgust for our own being and our indifference and our weakness and our hostility and our lack of direction and composure has become intolerable to us. It strikes us when year after year the longed-for perfection of life does not appear, when the old compulsions reign within us as they have for decades, and when despair destroys all joy and all courage. And sometimes at that moment, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is as though a voice were saying, You are accepted. You are accepted. Accepted by that which is greater than you, the name which you do not even know. Don't ask for the name now. Perhaps you'll find it later. Do not try to do anything now. Perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything. Do not perform anything. Do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact. You are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. And after such an experience, we may not be better than before. And we may not believe more than before. But everything is transformed. In that moment, grace conquers sin, and reconciliation bridges the gulf of estrangement, and nothing is demanded of this experience, no religious or moral or intellectual presupposition, nothing but acceptance. Radical grace pours into our world and finds its ways to the darkest corners the deepest pain, the greatest sinners, the most spiritually impoverished. The stories of grace that Jesus taught teach us this. The prodigal was struck by grace in that moment where he looked up from that pig pen where he served and realized, I can be a slave in my father's house. The man on the road who was assaulted by thieves was struck by grace when a Samaritan of all people stopped to care for him and tend him and show him God's love. And the one sheep who was lost was struck by grace when the shepherd left all others and came looking for it. Paul reminded the Galatians they were struck by grace even though they were residents of a world filled with idolatry and violence and oppression. He didn't want them to forget that radical grace They'd experience lest they find themselves filled with pride at their own works and become blind to the radical grace of God that had filled their world. And Paul also knew if they lost touch with this message of radical grace, they would cease to be vessels of grace that God could use to pour the love of God into the world. That's true for us as well. If we lose touch with the message of radical grace, We find ourselves incapable of sharing that grace with others. We become blind to the need for grace in our own lives. We become blind to all those around us who need to know about this incredible forgiveness 
that Christ has. We could all together too easily become like the Pharisee who saw this woman weeping at Jesus' feet and simply judged her as completely unworthy. Instead of seeing a child of God washed in the flood of grace, he just saw a sinner who was beneath him. When we let pride blind us in that way, then we end up looking at those around us as someone who needs God's judgment. And what they truly need in that moment is to hear this message of radical grace and forgiveness. They need to hear God's peace be with you. We have so much to celebrate in this place. We have much here that helps us grow in our faith. But the message of radical grace that flows from the cross of Christ must always must always, must always remain the core, the center, the touchstone, the anchor. All else, everything else here is secondary. If we allow any of these other things to become a measuring stick of what it means to be faithful, we reduce the death of Christ, as Paul said, to just a meaningless event that happened in history. The radical grace of God flowed into the world in the life, in the death, in the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And that radical grace is for everyone. It's intended to go everywhere. Not based on what I do or you do, what we do. It comes from completely outside of us. It's a grace that brings about our death in Christ and that raises us anew in Christ. And God sends that flood of grace into our world, into the darkest places in our own hearts, into the darkest places out there to find the people who are most broken and hurting. We're meant to carry that message of love with us at all times to those who are broken. It's radical. It's amazing. It's overwhelming. Praise be to God for the radical grace. And may God protect us from the sin of pride. It would blind our eyes or stop our ears or harden our hearts to how much we and the world need that radical grace. Amen.